Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 58 of the Startup Playbook podcast. My name is Rohit Pargava, and each week I interview successful founders, investors, and subject matter experts on how they got started, the strategies they use to succeed, and their advice to current and future entrepreneurs. This week, we'll be celebrating one year since the podcast launch on 19th of July in 2016. The podcast has come a long way over the last year, and I've learned so much from going through the process, all of which I'll share in a blog post being published tomorrow. But I just wanted to say a big thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the show over the last year. To celebrate the milestone, I'll be throwing a small party in a few weeks, so stay tuned to Twitter for details of the event, and you can find me on Twitter at Rohit Bhargava 7 My guest for this podcast episode is Ivan Lim. Ivan was the former head of marketing at Elto, which was acquired by GoDaddy before going on to become the co-founder and CEO of Brosa, an e-commerce business delivering designer furniture and homewares direct to customers. In 2015, just 18 months after launching, Brosa raised $2 million in Series A funding from Airtree Ventures, one of the leading VC funds in Australia, and have since gone on to continue scaling their growth with a team of over 70 people with multiple offices in Melbourne, China, and India. In this episode, we talk about seeking rejection, the importance of being intentional with culture, the future of e-commerce, and the fundraising process for early-stage startups. Without further ado, here is my interview with Ivan Lim. Hi, Ivan. Welcome to the Startup Playbook podcast, and thanks for taking the time to be on the show today. Thanks for having me. This is fun. Lots of, uh, lots of gadgets and gizmos. It's yeah, cool. with, with the VIP treatment. So yeah. we've, we've upgraded from our, uh, from our basic microphone to this, to this full $1,000 setup. <laughs> it looks Just, uh, it's pretty swish. It took uh, you like 15 minutes to set up. It was impressive. It did, it did. Uh, which is probably my fault for, for taking that long. But um, Ivan, for, for those people that may not be as familiar with you or your background story, do you want to share a little bit about yourself and um, what you're working on at the moment? Yeah, cool. Um, Wow. Okay. How far how far back should I go? Uh, I guess you know my. I mean, I, I come from a I come from a family of business people. Uh, you know, um, something that a lot of people don't know about me is when I was like maybe eleven or twelve. Um, all of us kids would sit around the dinner table, and my mom would be like, "Okay, so who's got a hundred thousand dollar business idea, and who's going to like buy a house first, right?" And so you know that was my that was my upbringing. You know, we spent a lot of time thinking about business, and I come from a typical business family. Um, I'm a I'm a graduate from the University of Melbourne. I did an arts uh, media communication degree and minored in political science. And uh, I thought when I when I came out of uni, I was going to work in public relations. You know, I was a journal journal type, and and I could write a lot. Uh, and I interned at a few places and they, they loved my work and they're like, I would love to hire you. And then the GFC came uh, in 2008 and it was just like nobody was hiring. And uh, they were like, look, Ivan, we want to hire you, but we got no roles. So my first job was actually in sales. I actually did like phone sales, selling uh, laptops and printer cartridges over the phone. And I remember it was my 21st birthday and I remember being so depressed. I was like calling my dad. I was just like, what am I doing with my life? Like um, I, I studied all this time to like sell computer equipment over the phone. And my dad was like, no, you're going to learn a lot about business, right? And so I did that for about a year and surprisingly... <clears throat> seems like people like to hear my voice over the phone. So uh, I hit all my sales targets and uh, and I began to self-teach myself digital marketing. Um, you know, things like in the early days of SEO and, and AdWords and, and things like that. And then I started to experiment and then I started uh, joining a friend's business that um, was uh, an online retailer of different niche products and then grew that into like one of Australia's fastest growing startups and then uh, started running my own thing and um, you know, headed up growth for Elto, which was a Blackbird Ventures company with Ned, uh, which was which was really fun. And then now I'm working on Brossa. Um, you know, we're we're a next generation uh, retailer of home and living uh, products, and uh, we help customers create beautiful spaces. And uh, we raised two million dollars from Airtree Ventures in July 2015, and we're having a lot of fun doing it. Yeah, fantastic. Obviously, I, I want to talk about uh, come come back to some of the the major success that you've had with with Brossa to to date. But looking back, you, you mentioned that when you were quite young, your parents were sort of, you know, pushing you, um, pushing you and your, your siblings about, um, you know, starting a business and coming up with ideas. At, at what point did you sort of realize that that was what you sort of wanted to do? I think, I think I realized when I was probably around 22, 23. And when I look back at my life and, and I remember there, there was a point in time where I had to kind of make some decisions about, well, do I want to kind of keep working in marketing and working for other people or do I want to kind of do something for myself and the point of clarity was when I looked back at my life and I realized that even though I wasn't starting businesses I had started a whole lot of initiatives that were like whether it was like a club or whether it was like a group and somehow I would just be at the very forefront kind of going 
I think we need to do this. And I feel like there's a real gap because nobody's doing this and we should do that. And I think um, naturally those things started to click into place. And I used to tell my parents, like, I don't, I'm not sure if I want to start a business. You know, they'll always be like, Ivan, no, you should go do it. And I was like, no, I'm not really sure. And then whether through osmosis or something, like it started to diffuse into my body. And, and yeah, it's just when I look back and I just went, you know what, I've actually been doing this for a long time. I didn't really realize I was being an entrepreneurial person, but that was what I was doing. So um, whether you call me a plan, uh, I would definitely wasn't a planned entrepreneur. I, I kind of feel sometimes like I was an accidental entrepreneur <laughs> and it just kind of happened. And I went, oh, okay, so I'm kind of doing this now. I guess this is what I should do. No idea about Lean Startup, no idea about all this sort of stuff, yeah. Uh, what did that look like? So I, I guess one of the biggest things for me um, from interviewing so many different guests is mm. Everyone's got a completely different story of, of how they got started and, and what sort of got them up to, to starting their, their first venture or, or what they're sort of working on at the moment. Um, you know, what did that sort of process look like for you in terms of looking after marketing for different, mm -hmm. for Elto, mm -hmm. for example? Mm -hmm. And what did that sort of teach you that you were then able to apply to Brosa? Yeah, so I actually started a business before Elto. It was called Vinceby and it was a... Uh, it was kind of like custom tailored clothing business for men. So we would kind of it would be like an online tailor, let people kind of, you know, measure themselves up and design their own shirts and suits. Uh, that became a nice cash flow business. We went through the Angel Cube Accelerator program uh, in the second batch. And uh, I remember just starting that business because I was, I was sitting in a coffee shop talking to a friend that time. I just went, I need a suit for a wedding. It's incredibly painful to go buy something. Why, why isn't anyone doing it like an online tailor? And then I looked it up and I realized no one's really doing it that well. And I thought, all right, I'm just going to start this, right? And I started it and then it started to pick up a bit of traction. So I left my job and I went, you know what? What's the worst that could happen, right? Like, I'll just do this for a while and see what happens. And um, it started bringing a good amount of revenue each month. And then I thought to myself, it's getting really lonely. I was a solo founder and I thought I'd like to get some support. So I started looking things up and I saw Angel Cube. And I thought, wow, this looks really interesting. The applications are open. And uh, Andrew Burt, um, who I think now is like head of marketing for Cleaning Cloud, and I think now he's doing stuff for Murudi for the IoT program, but he was running AngelCube at the time. And I remember Andrew's uh, phone number was on the AngelCube website. I thought, sucker. So, I'm <laughs> and, and bear in mind, like I've been calling people up selling like Pinter cartridges and like laptops, right? So like picking up the phone is not a problem. So I remember calling him up and I literally just pitched him the business right there. And then I went, you know, we're a custom tailored clothing business online. We help men find perfectly fitted clothes. Um, and after that, they just order the designs, right? We take the whole hassle out of shopping. And Andrew was like sold on it, right? And I was like a solo, non-technical founder going into like a tech accelerator, no idea what was going on. Uh, and that was really kind of how I, I just kind of started into it. I just went, you know, going to give it a go. And then you learn along the way, right? And you make mistakes, but, but you learn. I think that's the most important thing. I think curiosity and learning, you have to have this growth mindset, right? Like you have to be like, you know what? You're just going to, maybe you don't know this. You do it and you're like, well, that's wrong. Okay, what, what, what do I learn? Keep, keep iterating, keep iterating. So that, that's what happened to me at least, yeah. Sure. Um, when you were kind of speaking earlier about, um, you know, you had entrepreneurial tendencies, you just didn't know that you were an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. I feel like I had something very similar mm -hmm. as well. Um, I only found out recently, or looking back, that um, a lot of what I was doing in high school was, was entrepreneurial, uh, but I never thought that that was something that I kind of wanted to do. But um, one of the things that you mentioned was uh, jumping on the phone and, and making sales. I think that's such an important factor, especially for early stage startup founders of, you know, how do you convince other people and how do you sort of make your first few sales and, and things like that. What was, um, what was the process that you followed or, or what was some of the, the strategies that you used to, to make sales um, through the phone? Yeah, um I have, I'm probably the, f the first person to say that doing sales over the phone is really confronting. Uh, I have a tendency sometimes to take things personally, even though it's not personal. And so it becomes emotionally exhausting. I think that's a lot of, that's a lot of what um, intimidates people about doing sales online or over the phone. Um, the first thing you have to know is that sales is a numbers game. Um, you know, you just got to run through the numbers and the less that you overthink it and the more that you think, you know, I'm just going to work through the numbers and it's like, you know, you know your conversion rate's 10%, make 10 calls, you're going to make one sale, right? Like, sure, maybe at the 10 calls you don't get it, but when you get to 20 calls, you're going to make two sales, right? And so you just got to take, remove too much of the fear and just keep doing it. I think something that's been really helpful for me um, and 
you know, Ned Dwyer, who was um, the founder of Elto, and I spent a lot of time talking to him. We're still really good friends. His, um, he has a really good concept, which is you should seek rejection. Uh, and I think that's really, really important to do because every time you, if you're not afraid of rejection, you know that you seek it, you're going to learn from that. You're going to pick up something new and you're going to be, it, be able to iterate. You're going to be able to grow. And I think when you, people who have a growth mindset are not afraid of rejection, right? They're like, no, I will seek it because each rejection takes me closer to the point that I'm going to succeed. And they do that. So I think, I think without trying to seem overly like, you know, like, trying to pump you up, mentality is really, really important. Mindset is really, really important, this sort of stuff, yeah. Is that is that something that you think comes naturally to, to startup founders or mm. is that something that you think can be taught or, or nurtured? I think some people have a natural uh, level of grittiness. I think anyone who's read Angela Duckworth's book, Grit, um, will see that some people are naturally gritty, but I'm a big believer that grit is like a muscle. You have to develop it and you have to put yourself in, in situations that make you uncomfortable um, so that you do deliberate practice, right? Like Angela Duckworth talks through a lot of this deliberate practice. You go through these periods where it sucks, it's really hard, but you realize you're getting better and better at your craft, right? And I think it's those people who are willing to face those situations that grow much, much faster, right? Like I, I have so many friends who, you know, in my early days when I was kind of dabbling in all this sort of stuff, right? Like people were like, why are you wasting your time, Ivan? Like, what are you doing, right? And then one day when you're suddenly like, your startup's beginning to grow, people are like, oh my God, you're a genius, right? And, and I always tell people like in startups, like you're a maniac until one day you're a genius, right? Like it, it, this, this switch suddenly happens. But I think the reality is that you spend these years and years of deliberate practice and you're growing and sure, maybe from the outside, other people are like really comfortable kind of doing their own thing. And it's great. Like, I mean, I'm not saying that chasing a, a more comfortable career is not a good thing, but I'm saying that it's definitely not optimized for growth. And if you want to build something that's ambitious in your life, um, I think you have to optimize for growth, right? And deliberate practice is a big part of that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, speaking of uh, seeming like a maniac when, <laughs> when you kind of start, uh, one of the things that we were sort of talking about um, before we turned on the the podcast was, um, you know, what the early days would have looked like for Brosa. Uh, you know, um, again, using the example of just trying to sell t-shirts online and trying to work out logistics is hard enough, let alone trying to um, sort that out for, for huge mm. pieces of furniture. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, what, what were some of the challenges that you kind of faced early on and how did you sort of work through, work through those obstacles? I think, um, like you said, furniture is big, bulky items, and I think that is the challenge, but that's also the opportunity for us, right? We're, we're solving a really hard problem in that we are on scale trying to develop this seamless digital first experience for customers that involves a physical product that's difficult to ship, right? It's not like t-shirts. Um, and, you know, some some of the war stories that, you know, I've shared with my team, and they, they love this because it's, it's just hilarious, is um, I remember the first container of, of of sofas arrived into the country and uh, Richard, one of my co-founders and I were like, yeah, it's arrived. Great. You know, it was in the warehouse and we're like, well, uh, we're, we're going to go unload the container. Right. And I remember it was a Friday night and uh, I said to Richard, so, so when should we, uh, when should we do this? He's like, oh, let, let's meet tomorrow. You know, we'll, we'll come around to my place at 11 and then we'll drive down. So I got there at like 11 and Richard got in the car and we were driving down to Murabin, which is where the warehouse was, our first one. And, um, we're just like, oh, I'm, I'm really hungry. Let's uh, let's stop by for lunch. And I went, we got enough time? He was like, yeah, yeah, no problem. So I was like, cool. I was messaging my friends. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to be at the barbecue later. I'll see you guys later, right? So I was already making plans, right? We finished lunch at like 12.30. And then we get to the container. And I swear to you, uh, we thought it'd be two hours. Um, by 10 p.m., we were still there trying to unload stuff. It was so difficult, like the physical unload. Like we, we had no idea how difficult this would be, right? And that taught us so much. I remember sitting there in the warehouse. I still remember the smell of that first warehouse and just thinking, I, I thought to myself, how are we going to scale this business? This is so difficult. Uh, I was telling you the other story, which was that in the early days, no couriers wanted to actually deliver our, our product, right? Um, and, you know, we would have couriers who would call us at like 4 p.m. when they're supposed to arrive at 4.30 and be like, we're not arriving, sorry. And we'd have customers going, I'm expecting my product. The strategy was Ivan, go to the courier driver and like distract him. Just talk to him <laughs> about anything, right? Like buy him a packet of smokes or something and just distract him. And Richard, like load the, the, the truck as fast as possible to sofas before he realizes what happens. But 
again, like it's, 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 it's all this grit stuff, right? Like we just refuse to say no. We were just like, well, we're just going to try this. We're just going to go for it. And so we learned so much through that process. I remember Richard told me, you know, one day, Ivan, we're going to be able to control our own deliveries. And, and I was telling you, like, um, you know, now we, we actually have our own Brussels branded trucks um, moving around Melbourne and Sydney and soon Brisbane and across capital cities as well. And so we wouldn't have been able to do those things if we didn't go through those hard, hard months of like, sitting there going, don't know how we're going to scale this. Do you want to give up? No, don't want to give up. Let's just keep working at it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I can imagine that, you know, obviously there are very, very hard and very tough challenges mm. that you face early on, mm. but those challenges never really go away. They just change. Mm. <laughs> um, mm. What are, you know, obviously now you've got a team of over 70 in, in multiple different offices, as you mentioned. Um, what are some of the challenges that you've sort of faced in, in growing the company that you potentially might not have might not have occurred to you um, right at the start. Oh, okay. Um, I, yeah, that's a, that's a really really good question. I think um, I think I think one of the really big things that was really challenging was um, for the founders to actually understand the full limitations of what we can and can't do, um, and. Um, learning to be very honest with ourselves um, and having to define our roles a lot more. Um, you know, in the early days, we used to do everything. Like, I would jump into this, Dave would jump into that, Richard would jump into this, and, and we would just own everything. I think as, as time has gone on, we've realized that we all have our own strengths and, and there's certain things that we should and shouldn't do. And being able to be very frank and upfront with the founders, we actually have founder feedback sessions. So we sit down once a quarter and uh, there's a simple list. There is, what does Ivan do well? What does Ivan not do well? What's he shit at? And, um, and we go through that list and we tell each other very, very honestly. And I think, you know, I, I, I always thought that, you know, we, we would just kind of just, you know, just drive and sail all the way through, right? But I've realized that, you know, um, all these very frank conversations, particularly for the founders and evolving in our role as founders, especially as you go from, you know, in the early days, just three people. Now we have like a warehouse department. We have a tech team that's building all our software, which is amazing. We've got a data science team. We've got a finance team. We've got a design team. Like we've got all these things and we're like, we're having to learn how to manage these things, you know, and, and how to manage a board um, and, you know, for myself, how to be a good CEO. And that's, that's been really, really challenging. So um, I knew I'd have to grow. I didn't realize I have to grow at this velocity this much. So it's, it's been really good. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So like the whole kind of self-awareness piece is, is something that I'm, I'm really, really big on. Is, is there anything that you, uh, you know, obviously you kind of touched on, on the founder feedback sessions. Mm. Is there anything that you sort of used earlier on to kind of help gauge that? And I assume, you know, also when you're hiring new people as well, that's, that's a big component of what, mm. what it is that you look mm. for. So how do you, how do you break that down? Oh, I mean, I, I think part of it is I'm, I'm, I like to think I'm, I'm a little bit more self-aware. Um, I like to critique myself a little bit more. But I think one of the things that I do that helps me, sorry, um, is that I have a lot of friends outside of startup. Um, and um, they, they have no idea about the world that I'm in. Um, they're just kind of like, well, you're raising all this money. And, and some of them are like business people. You know, they do their own thing. And they're great business people. They just build businesses in a different way. But when I meet them, we don't get caught up into this whole world of like, oh, Ivan, you're a venture backed fun, air trees on board, like things are skyrocketing. Like they, they see things from a very different perspective. And because of that, they will pull me up on things that for a normal person they'll see, right? But maybe in startup land, we get blinded to that, right? And that helps keep my feet on the ground. I think that that really helps me see myself in a different light where I don't get caught up in all of this like, oh, rah, 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 right? Which, because I, I think startup land can sometimes be a little bit like that. Um, so I, I think it's really helpful. I think also uh, family and, and close friends is really, really important. I'm really close to my sister. And again, she also runs her own businesses, incredibly talented, works like 20 times harder than I do. Um, but she keeps me in check, you know? Like, uh, I think you're, you're gonna have to allow people to call bullshit on you um, and give them permission to. I think that's really, really important. You have to give people permission to do that sort of stuff because as much as you're naturally gonna realize things about yourself, other people are gonna see that a lot faster. And if you give them permission to tell you that, I think that's really important, yeah. Sure. Um, I know from sort of previous conversations and, uh, and things like that, that one of the really important things for you and, and for Brosa is company culture. Mm. Um, how does that sort of company culture scale for you or how does that change when you go from three to, to 70 plus people around the world? Yeah, it's, it's, it's really challenging. I mean, we've got an office in Melbourne. We're headquartered here. We've got an office in China and we've got an office in India, um, which manage a lot of our different makers. I mean, we've got makers here in Australia and China, India, Vietnam, 
Europe. I think we've even got a maker in Israel as well. And so we've got quite a few different makers. Um, but having team members in different countries and from different cultures um, is challenging. But having said that, you know, one of our cultural values is we love diversity. We've got over 20 nationalities in our team and we think that that is an amazing thing. So I think one of the first things that I've learned is that um, you have to be very intentional with culture. You 100% you have to be intentional. Um, in the early days, we thought, oh, everyone kind of gets it, right? Like we're all on the same page. Like, uh, you know, company lunch on Fridays, it's the same five people around the table, right? And then eventually, I realized that I don't even know when certain people leave anymore, right? So it's like, you don't have as regular conversations as you used to have. So <clears throat> one of the first few things that we did was we set up like actual defined cultural values. And so um, about, about, um, um, about, Three months ago, we established our company values, um, and it was a it was a process of really talking to a lot of people, <coughs> talking to a lot of people about how they felt about the company culture, and um, and then really, I think also contributing in terms of what we felt was important for us. And so I think having clear ideas and understandings of what it is, because if people don't have a common understanding, it's very difficult for them to protect that company culture. And um, and I think, so once you have that defined, then from there, once you understand what it is, you have to be creative and open to how that gets implemented. And so one of the things that I learned really quickly was that, um, you know, curious problem solvers is one of our company values. Um, so we encourage people to be curious and to solve problems and to be like constantly learning. I realized that how that is translated in Melbourne is very different from how that's translated in China, right? And that's totally okay. You have to be okay with people interpreting that and expressing that same concept and that value in a different way. And I think that's the beauty of it, yeah. Sure. Um, speaking <clears throat> of being curious, um, you know, obviously the the startup ecosystem on its own has, has developed so quickly, but so has technology. Um, <coughs> I'm I'm curious to know what does you know how has like the 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 landscape of e-commerce changed from mm. when Brosa first started to what yeah. it's like now and where do you see that heading? Yeah, great question. Um, so I think e-commerce has had a bit of a rough patch over the years. I think a, a lot of investors are like, oh, I'm not sure about e-commerce, and you know, there's there's been a lot of like blowups. Like you, you think about Fab, you think about a lot of investors who put money into e-commerce business and and not gotten their returns and. I think e-commerce has evolved a lot and then we're an e-commerce business and, and I think you know the old days of doing third-party products uh, where you're selling other people's products like a Nike shoe, for example, somebody goes on sale, 20% off, you have to match 20% off and you're selling this commoditized product. I think the days of that, I think is really, really hard because chances are Amazon's gonna kill you, right? They've, they've got this huge beam off of a business. I think th the reality of it right now, the way I like to think about it is that I think it's never easy to build a brand, but it's never been easier today to build a brand, right? And because of that, because of the internet and the penetration of online uh, commerce, it's you're, you're seeing all these amazing brands pop up in different product verticals. You think about glasses, Warby Parker, you think about clothing, Bonobos, you think about mattresses, Casper, you think about furniture, you think about Brossa. Um, but they're these amazing brands that are digitally native and reinventing the whole customer experience using technology. They start off with software and they go, how do we make this whole experience better? And how do we do it under a brand that drives immense loyalty, right? And so you're seeing these amazing um, retail brands actually pop up where e-commerce is the primary channel, <clears throat> but it's a digital first experience. And so for us, the way that we see it in Brossa is that, you know, we combine a huge amount of deep vertical integration. Like we go deep into the supply chain. Like we make all our products. We work alongside the makers. We have in some instances, people sleep in the room right next door to our makers. They wake up and go, let's go make furniture, right? Which is great. And so that gives a great amount of control. We design everything house, but we build an immense amount of technology and data that allows us to launch the right products, control that supply chain on scale. And the whole idea is to give customers a much better experience than having to buy um, from a from a regular retailer selling an, another third party brand and give customers something that's superior and different. So, I think e-commerce is is actually on its way back. I think uh, it's a really exciting space. I think uh, investors are still you know can can sometimes be a bit tentative, but I'm I'm always for the contrarian view. You know, I think uh, SaaS and all those businesses are fantastic, but e-commerce is, is, is a really exciting space that we're always passionate about. I think we're seeing a new wave of great businesses. You only need to look at Dollar Shave Club and, and look at a few of those great exits that have been coming out. So hopefully we'll see more. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Um, what, one of the things that you just mentioned there was um, was investors. Mm. And um, 
I think it was eighteen months into into Brosa launching that you managed to raise two. Was it two million? Two, two million, from yeah, Airtree? yeah, from Airtree, yeah. Um, again, mm. what was that sort of process like? As you sort of mentioned, of you know, um, perhaps the interest in e-commerce was going mm. down mm. a little bit. What what was that process like in terms of fundraising and then getting on you know one of the the premier sort of VC funds in, in Australia to back you? I think um, in any circumstance, fundraising is challenging. Any anybody will tell you that, right? Like no matter no matter how much you raise it's still a lot of work, right? Um, and so in, in our process, I mean, I think we were fortunate in that very early on in the business, we saw traction quite quickly. Um, and, and I think it comes down to the founders being a little bit more experienced. Like it wasn't our first time at the rodeo, like we'd done this before. And so, you know, even within the first like three, four months, um, I think by like month four, we we're doing like $100,000 a month. So things were growing really quickly. And so I think there was that traction. So that definitely helped open a lot of doors with VCs. But, um, you know, it, it was very much a, a sense of, sure, VCs were interested in talking to us, but I was also interested to make sure that they actually understood what we were doing, right? And so I was always of the opinion that, look, as much as you're assessing us, I'm also assessing you, Mr. Investor, and I want to kind of know what value you're going to bring to this business. And I wanted to make sure they understood that. So, um, you know, we, we went out in like September um, 2014, um, and we... Um, you know, we'd only been like six months old, seven months old, and we're thinking maybe we should go raise some money. And and uh, we spoke to quite a few different firms and funds, and uh, we had we had a few um, offers and term sheets, and and they were interesting. But we thought, you know, the valuation isn't quite right. Um, Airtree were one one of the guys we were chatting to as well, and and they were very supportive, really good advice. But we just thought, you know what, I think the business is not uh, mature enough yet, so we're going to go back and and work on the business. And Airtree were great in that. I remember talking to Craig, who's our investor, and he said, you know what definitely like take your time figure out what you want to do but you guys should really work on these five things right and we went oh cool all right um, we'll take free advice why not and uh we worked on those five things for the next five months uh and five months later the business had continued growing the economics had changed the, the business got so much stronger right and um you know it was great proof for us because we we're like well airtree know what they're talking about and for airtree it was great proof for them because they're like well these are entrepreneurs who can execute right and so um, yeah, I remember, you know, just uh, we were thinking about opening our, 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 our fundraising again in 2015. And, um, you know, I pinged Craig and I said, hey, I'm, I'm, we're opening up a round. We're, we're going to go chat to a few investors. He's like, cool, let's, let's catch up when you're in Sydney. Caught up with him on Sydney on a Friday. By the time I got to the airport, he was like, come back in on Tuesday, present to the investor committee, present on the Tuesday. And then by the Friday after, we had term sheets. And, um, you know, I think that, that's one of the things like it's, it's hard and then it's slow and then it's fast. But that, that was our experience. Yeah, yeah I, I think one of the things that you mentioned, um, I've seen a lot of chat on Twitter about this uh, recently as well, is um, you know as much as investors are assessing you, you need to invest the assess the investor as mm -hmm. well and just make sure that they're the right partner in the business because they can fire you, but you can't fire an, an investor <laughs> yeah, yeah. on your cap table. Yeah. Um, so so finally, Ivan, I, I know one of the things that uh, again is really sort of important and close to you is giving back to the ecosystem. And so you have the the Founders Apprentice Program. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So <clears throat> I can't take all the credit for it. It was it was the idea of Ned Dwyer, um, Ned being the founder of Elto. And um, you know when they had first raised their seed uh, round, I think they raised like five hundred thousand um, dollars for Elto. One of the ideas from Ned was that he wanted to take on a Founders Apprentice, and the idea was to bring on a high caliber, high potential person who could be a founder in the future and let them work alongside him and learn the ins and outs of being a founder. I was fortunate enough that, that Ned decided to take me on. Uh, and I had just come off uh, Vinspy, which is the suit business, and I, and I realized, nice lifestyle business, don't think I want to dedicate the next five years of my life. And I was like, I need to get involved in, an, in the next project. And um, you know, Ned and I had known each other for a bit of time, we worked out in Inspire9, uh, I'd helped him out on a few things, and I really liked him. And um, I remember sitting there for, for a good eight months in the initial, the first eight months, we were just in a room. Uh, in the site point offices and we were just sitting there and it was just me, Ned and PJ, another co-founder. And it, it, I, I saw everything. I saw up, down, product, you know, ideas, um, iterations, testing. Um, you know, I remember like we were testing out different initiatives where I had to wake up at like 3 a.m. in the morning in order to try different things like, you know, webinars and so on. And it was great. I learned so much from that. And from working at Elto, I then started Brossa and, um, 
you know, it, 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 it became apparent to me that I wouldn't be where I am without the sort of investment from people like Ned. And I thought to myself, well, who better to pay it forward than the guy who got so much from it? And so um, I think it was last year that we decided to do the Founders Apprentice program ourselves at Brossa. Um, and I was telling um, Dave and Richard, and I said, look, I know it's it's not exactly like a specific job description. I know that it may seem like a distraction, but I think this is important, right? Like I think it's important that we're going to get a high caliber person, but I think it's also important we get back to the ecosystem because the stronger the ecosystem is, the better it is for everybody, right? The better, the more founders, the better founders, the more exits, the more money, the more talent, everything, yada, yada, yada. And so, uh, yeah, we, we brought on uh, Will. Will came on board with us um, and, and he, uh, he started off in the customer team. We sent him there and we gave him specific things that we wanted to solve and he worked alongside us um, all the way through and Will's progressed really well. So Will's actually not even in Melbourne right now. He's uh, gone to set up our India office. So, uh, wow. so that's, 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 it's a great story. You know, it's, it's great that somebody's been able to do that. And, um, you know, we, we, we love empowering, um, you know, young, talented people. And so... I love the conversations I have when young, talented people kind of reach out to me and say, hey, this is what I've done and so on. And it's like, you know, I'm like, yeah, cool. Let's get a coffee and this chat. And if I can help you along the way, absolutely. Because I think it helps everybody. Yeah. Fantastic. I think mm -hmm. it's a, I think it's a great initiative. Mm. Um, I, I encourage more, more startups to, to potentially do it themselves. You know, if you can, um, I think it's, it, I think it's a great thing. I think it's a great thing. There's one, if there's one thing that, that startups in Australia or the ecosystem doesn't have, and, and we don't talk enough about, like we talk a lot about funding. We talk a lot about all sorts of things, but I think we don't talk enough about the talent pool that's in the startup ecosystem. Like, um, you know, if you go to Silicon Valley, you go to other sort of startup hubs, the culture has been there that people who work in startups know what's involved, right? But I think in Australia, it hasn't developed to the point yet that you still get a lot of people who are fresh to startups and they come into a completely different world. They don't realize the intensity, right? Like mm. we've had so many people where, you know, in the interview process, I'm like, you know, you ready for something fast paced? I'm like, yeah, I'm all over the fast pace, man. I'm like, I'm all good. And then they come in and within the first week, like by Friday, I look at them and they look exhausted. They look like super excited, but they're exhausted. And I'm like, how was it? And I said, man, you guys move really quick. And, um, and I think the more that we're able to kind of develop great talent who understand this, the stronger our company is going to be because we need a high grade talent to do ambitious things, right? And so you, you need really good talent, yeah. Mm. Absolutely. Um, on that note, Ivan, thanks so much for, for joining us today on the Startup Paper podcast. Um, if anyone wants to stay in touch, say hello, uh, find out more about you or, or about Brosa, what's what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, I think Twitter is probably the best way. Um, so I'm at Ivan Melvin. Um, and you probably find me on Twitter. If not, you can also look me up on LinkedIn and, and drop me a line. Um, but yeah, that's probably the best way to find me. Perfect. I'll make sure those, those links are in the show notes. Ivan, awesome. once again, thanks for coming on and, and sharing your experience and insights. This was fun. Thanks, Sarit. Right. Cheers. Bye. Thanks for listening to episode 58 of the Startup Playbook podcast. You can find the show notes of my interview with Ivan, along with a curated list of tools and resources for startup founders at startupplaybook.co. As always, you can join the conversation through our Twitter account. The handle is at Playbook Startup. Don't forget to stay tuned on social media for details of our birthday party. In the meantime, subscribe to stay up to date with our latest episodes. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you at episode 59 next week.